Welcome. It's a joy to offer these sessions to you, all aimed at exploring our aliveness and our kinship with each other. But the truth is that while we can look at these timeless dynamics of living together, only you can personalize what insights and skills will work for you. Honestly, I have no answers and what I share are examples, not instructions. We are just comparing notes on what it means to be alive like so many before us. And in doing so, we are keeping honest company with each other. My job in these sessions is to help introduce you to your own gifts and your own wisdom and to start more things than we can finish so that this work will spill out of these sessions into the rest of your life. So this session will explore the fire of aliveness. And I'd like to begin with a poem and a quote. The po and the poems and, and the questions that I'll invite you into throughout these sessions will be available to you in your online materials. So you don't need to worry about writing down the questions. The poem is one of mine and it's called The Mistake. And, and I was led to this poem because the word mistake really doesn't mean wrongdoing. It means mistaking. It means picking up what we didn't aim for. So this is called The Mistake. The wind had been knocked out of me and doubled over. I looked like I was asking for something. It was then that someone passing by offered me something precious, which I managed to hold briefly before dropping. And when I dropped it, it fell into someone else's hands and she was so grateful. She called me kind and generous. She couldn't thank me enough, but it was only a mistake. I felt compelled to admit that I had merely dropped something precious at this she put what I had dropped down and took my face and said, don't you see? Even dropping what is precious is a gift. And it made me cry. And while she rocked me, what was precious rolled toward a bird who fluttered over it. It finally landed at the feet of a small child who hugged what was given, what was dropped, what was a mistake, what was let go in order to hold someone lost. The little one just hugged it and turned to her mother in awe, shouting, look what I found, look what I found. And so often in our journey, when we aim for one thing and we mistake it for another, the gift is often and the lesson are often waiting, not in what we aim for, but in what we find and having the courage to accept that and to let loved ones point out, no, no, it's over here. <laughs> so the quote I'd, I'd like to open with is from the novelist Norman Mailer. And he wrote, that law of life so cruel and just demands that one must grow or else pay for remaining the same. That law of life so cruel and just demands that one must grow or else pay for remaining the same. And it does bring to mind another quote, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali famously said, if you are the same person at 50 as you were at the age of 20, well, you've wasted 30 years. <laughs> we are all dynamic and we are meant to grow. And it's not easy to grow, which is another reason why we need each other. So now let's explore the fire of aliveness. What do I mean by this? Well, I offer to you that there are two fires that we encounter daily. Everyone alive does. The first is the fire of life, which reduces us to joy by burning away everything that is false and not essential. This is the fire of aliveness that needs to be fed no matter where we are or what we do. This, this is the light of the soul 
and it must be kept burning just like you would keep a fire in a campsite burning by throwing twigs on it and branches and relighting it if it were to go out. But the second fire, well, this is the fire in the world. And this is the fire that can burn us up. It can hurt us. It can wound us and damage us. And this is the fire of circumstance that needs to be put out. So very quickly, we come to this, this endless uh, question that needs to be answered over and over again. No one is exempt. How do we know the difference between these two fires? It's a very important difference. What fire do we feed and what fire do we put out? Well, I honestly, I don't know. I have some thoughts, um, but no one knows. I myself, I have been reduced to what is essential by the one fire. And I, I've been burned and wounded by the flames of the other more than once. Nevertheless, we need each other to know and get better at discerning which fire do we feed and which fire do we douse. To continually know the difference is part of the practice of being human and helping each other know the difference. Well, this is part of the work of love. So one important skill that we each need to learn is how to discern what is life-giving and what is life-draining. And then how do we feed the fire of aliveness, which is life-giving? And how do we douse the fire of circumstance, which is always life-draining? We only have our heart to navigate these things. Which fire do we light and which to put out? It, it, it can almost be seen as a mantra. So all of this, this brings us to the gift of sensitivity. Now, Sensitivity is like radar for the heart. <laughs> it's how we know very precisely what's around us, what's within us, what's in the way, what's good for us, what's not. And, you know, sensitivity itself is, is how can we allow it to serve us? It's a great gift, and it is also a very delicate instrument. You know, if we are too open, if we are too sensitive, we can become wounded and burdened. But if we're not sensitive enough, well, then we shut down. We get removed and untouchable. Neither extreme is good, and it's not like we arrive at any one state. This is a constant, a constant, a constant effort to steer and course correct, you know. And much of what I will share throughout these sessions, well, this will apply to it. You know, there is no arrived state. We don't arrive, we course correct. You know, my father, I'll mention him throughout these sessions, he was a master woodworker and he loved the sea. He loved the sea and I spent a lot of time in my youth on a sailboat, a 30-foot catch that he built. And when I was a boy and we'd be in the fog, he somehow sensed I had an ability to, to really pay attention. So he would ask me to be at the tiller or the steering wheel to work on a compass and he'd point out the direction and ask me to keep us on course. So even at a young age, and anyone who's ever done this has tried to steer by a compass, even when on course, it, the, the, the compass needle never stands still. It's always wavering. So even when you're on course, you have to go, oh, oh, wait, a little to the right. Oh, wait, a little to the left. And years later, my father's now gone about seven years, and there are many lessons I'm hearing from him now that he's gone. And this is one of them, you know. The, the, when we are steering, the art of being sensitive, the practice, the spiritual personal practice we each have to inhabit, it's you're always course correcting it. Oh, no, it's a little to the left. It's a little to the right. Oh, I'm a little, I'm a little too sensitive and I'm holding on to these wounds. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a little removed. How do I get back right into that, that on course, that on course band of sensitivity? You know, years ago when I was researching one of my early books, The Exquisite Risk, I came upon this amazing thing in the uh, mythology of, of Egypt. And in Egyptian mythology, is, there is this ceremony known as the trial of heart ceremony. 
And what this opens is that each person, once they die, before they can be allowed into the afterlife, the gods would weigh their departed heart. They would balance their heart on a scale against the feather of truth. And if on that scale, the heart that had lived a whole life was lighter than the feather of truth, well, it was believed that that heart had not experienced it enough in life. It had held back. It had not participated fully in the journey to glimpse or understand all the timeless truths. But if the heart was heavier than the feather of truth, well, then it was believed that that heart had harbored too much of its experience. It hadn't surrendered enough, but it was churning with all of its backlog of envies and wrongs and misfortune and the, the pain of its wounds, unprocessed wounds. Only, only if the heart was balanced with the feather of truth was it believed that that soul had led a full life and was then allowed into the afterlife. Well, you know, when I came upon this ritual, I was I was really dumbfounded. It was, it's very profound, but I thought immediately, forget the afterlife. This is a practice we can use while we're living, while we're living. This is a way to uh, continually take inventory. Are we holding back or are we uh, drowning in our sensitivity? So my my take-home journal question for you is around this Egyptian trial of heart. And, and you'll be able to find this uh, online along with the course. So I'm going to invite you, and, and when you journal like this, because I'll ask you several times to journal throughout these sessions, I invite you to, to write in a journal something personal, something that you like to go through, even choose something to write with that feels good. And, and set aside... 10, 15 minutes where you're in a quiet place and enter the journal question as you would a conversation with a wise elder. Let the question bring to you insight that's waiting inside yourself but hasn't been given voice yet. So in this first question, I'm going to invite you to explore the open balance of your living heart and to begin to tell the story of one way in which you have participated fully in your own journey and how that has lightened your heart. Then I will ask you, can you describe one way in which you've harbored or held on to too much of your experience and how that is weighing down your heart? And once you've spent some time with that, I would ask you, what risk might you take in your life to participate more fully in your own life? And what risk might you take to surrender some of what is weighing down your heart? You see, beyond right or wrong or blaming ourselves, this kind of ongoing course correction or inventory helps us stay enlivened and feed the fire of aliveness while protecting ourselves from the fire of circumstance. And this raises, you know, this, this question, this how, how, do we, how do we engage and inhabit the art of being sensitive? You know, most of us spend so much time, rightfully, in our lives, removing what's in the way so we can be sensitive, so we can really be fully here that once we are sensitive, we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, no one has a lot of practice. And so how do we make good use of our heart and get strength from what we know? This is a lifelong practice, you know. We have always seen that the very sensitivity that can save us and bring us alive, well, it, it can also throw us under. I want to give a few examples on both sides of this so that you can better see where are you in your journey, in your practice of being sensitive. One poignant example 
of being thrown under by our sensitivity is the gifted poet Sylvia Plath. And some of you might remember her. And in 1963, she suffered from depression and uh, she took her own life at the age of 30. She had tremendous gifts and this was very tragic. And she appears to have been one of those who was born with a godlike sensitivity that she, she just couldn't turn off. She was unable to escape the fire of circumstance and not quite able to feed the fire of her aliveness. And, you know, these stories that I'm sharing, they, we, all, we all go through this. What lived in Sylvia Plath lives in us. And we can learn from these stories. Now, in that story, the poet Ted Hughes was married to Sylvia Plath, and after she was gone, he raised their only son, and, and sadly, she, his son, Nick, her son, Nicholas, their son, of course, Nicholas, he sadly also suffered from depression, and in 2009, he sadly, he, he also took his own life. And in the months before, in a letter to Nicholas, his father, Ted Hughes, wrote, quote, this is how we measure our real respect for people, by the degree of feeling they can register, the voltage of life they can carry and tolerate and enjoy. And in this deep, deep, honest remark from this widower and powerless father who was trying, he was trying to honor the fire of aliveness and the danger of circumstance. He was trying to warn his sensitive son of that fine line between the, the voltage of life that, wow, just brings us alive and, and the pain inherent in the voltage of life. We each stand between these two fires, these two charges, and we, we each have to find our way. And, and I will be giving examples on the other side, so rest assured. Uh, one more example, though, a poignant example, of someone who suffered their godlike sensitivity is the amazing painter Vincent van Gogh. You know, while at the same time he had this amazing fire of aliveness that literally roared through him into his paintings, at the same time it the, that overwhelming sensitivity um, it consumed him. It consumed him. And the closer he got to rendering literally the, the way that, that life was working underneath our surface, you know, uh, uh, the prime minister of France, Clemenceau, in the, in the 1880s, 70s and 80s, he, was, he knew Van Gogh and he knew Monet. And he, he said about both of them that they were like human microscopes. And this was at a time when the microscope was actually being discovered and refined as an actual instrument. And what he meant, he went on to say that, you know, they are looking, you know, Van Gogh is looking the, so far into the, he's painting the energy of life. So that in his canvases, the sky looks like it's on fire and the ocean looks like it's air and the ground looks like the sea. But in his sensitivity as a human being, this disoriented him. He wasn't able to hold on to ground himself. And we too, we struggle with these things, what to do with our sensitivity. But we do have uplifting examples of those who were enlivened by the sensitivity and they, they are teachers too. Consider the poets Walt Whitman or the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda or the great poet from the Northwest in America, William Stafford, or the sculptor Auguste Rodin and the, the incredible Renaissance genius, Leonardo da Vinci, or the humanitarian who started the Red Cross, Clara Barton, as well as the great more contemporary leader, Nelson Mandela, and the modern dancer, Ted Sean, just to name a few. The truth is that we each experience our own degree of this godlike sensitivity. And each of us are enlivened and consumed by it. So one of life's initiations is to learn how to make a resource of our sensitivity without shutting it down, how to get strength from what we know. And in some way, all of our sessions together 
we'll explore the many ways we can work to inhabit our sensitivity in a life-giving way. You know, I want to I want to turn to the famous young British poet John Keats, uh, who famously wrote, we all probably read it in high school, Ode on a Grecian Urn. And, you know, famously, the last two lines of that poem are, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Well, this is a, a, a wonderful, profound insight. And if it weren't for those last two lines, we wouldn't know the poem. But let me quickly tell you the story. John Keats was, was this amazing, precociously talented young man. He actually had just finished studying to become a surgeon and all the while was a poet. And in his early 20s, he contracted tuberculosis. And he was, you know, dying from it. And so he went um, to Rome to stay with a friend. And so imagine this, the sensitivity in this young, precocious man. He knew he was gaining insights by the day, and he knew that he would never have time to turn them into poetry or into relationships. And there he was, tiring in this apartment on the Spanish steps in Rome. And there was an urn, a Grecian urn in antiquity. And he, he said, oh my God, if, if I could just stop all this and just be one of those figures on that urn, if I could just get out of here. And that's how he started writing it. But the deeper lines beyond this lament were at the end, all of a sudden there's this insight, his sensitivity said, no, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know because truth helps us douse the fire of circumstance, while beauty helps us keep the fire of aliveness lit. And love, I would add love, love helps us discern between the two. How do we do this? Well, only you can uncover this for yourself. And my hope is that our time together will help you inhabit your own personal way of practicing truth beauty, and love. So I, I'd like to close this session with two short poems of mine which yield, yield an insight. And I, I must say, share with you that when I write these poems, I really retrieve them. That is, I give my attention to a question, a wonder, a pain, an image, a confusion. And by being authentic, I am given an insight that becomes my teacher. And then I have to spend time with it. So I don't always know what these poems mean or where they go. So let me share what these two poems, what they bring to me as we <clears throat> bring this session to a close. Being here, transcending down into the ground of things is akin to sweeping the leaves that cover a path. There will always be more leaves and the heart of the journey, the heart of our awakening, is to discover for ourselves that the leaves are not the ground, and that sweeping them aside will reveal a path. And finally, to fully live, we must take the path and keep sweeping it. And the second poem is called Practicing. As a man in his last breath drops all he is carrying, each breath is a little death that can set us free. So these two small poems, these small teachers, they offer us a way to meet the days. For no matter the trouble we find ourselves in, we always have this ongoing vow to help us to sweep and drop to sweep and drop. And I invite you to reflect on one way that you can sweep the leaves of worry and fear aside to refine your own path. And one way that you can drop all you are carrying to be close again to life. So I thank you for your presence and your attention. And I thank you for being here. And I look forward to our next session together. So for now, 
many blessings.